Hey, Zach. Hello, hello. What's up? Hmm, nothing. Fancy seeing you here. No. Uh, why the heck do you think I asked you to do this video? Why did you ask me to do this video? I think because I was the kid in the back of the classroom that would kind of joke around my friends. But then I think seriously, I think I have a fair bit of experience with co-ops um, kind of spread out between big four firms, um, NPO space, and then I've kind of also switched big four. So I think I have a bit of experience in terms of different paths that you can take in the accounting um, kind of stream of things. So I think that's probably why. Yeah. All, that, all of the above. Uh, no? Yeah, you got stuff done. I remember um, asking you at one point uh, something, uh, and I forget exactly what it was, but your answer was, I play sports. Like, I can see the angles. I can connect the dots. And um, so how about, um, yeah, tell me if you can remember more than I can about that, how do you relate school to sports and kind of your problem solving in one area to the other? I think sports, so a bit of background on myself, I played competitive hockey growing up. So I think that kind of taught me, I was never the best player, but I think I always worked pretty hard and kind of knew when I needed to work hard. So I think coming, kind of transitioning that into school, I think um, kind of competitive sports allowed me to kind of figure out how to work hard and really push to achieve a goal. And then, so in fourth, third and fourth year, I started actually setting academic goals, which I think kind of helped me. And then I started building confidence and then, yeah, kind of reached those goals. And then here I am now. So I think sports can kind of teach you a lot of lessons in ac academically, but also kind of working. And I'm currently working in an audit and we work in teams all the time. So kind of playing hockey or team sport growing up allowed me to kind of know how to work with different people from different backgrounds, have a common goal. So I think kind of sports and especially competitive sports can kind of transition well to academics and um, your working life afterwards. Absolutely. Uh, I do recall it was my, so your class, uh, your year was my first year teaching uh, the fourth year. So teaching IFA2 and AA2. And I remember saying in class, you know, I'm the one that makes the course. I'm the one that makes the assignments. I'm the one that teaches this. I'm the one that makes the test. I'm the one that marks the test. So ask me questions about how to do well, if that's what you're curious, like whatever your definition of success is, like, use me. <laughs> like, yeah, there's yeah. no, there's no secrets. If you ask something um, and I don't feel comfortable answering, I won't. And you were one of the very few people that, that did ask. And I'm like, thank you. Cause I also invited it. So, yeah. um, so I really appreciated that. And you say that you were the person in the back of the class that joked around with your friends and that's true, but you also got shit done, which yeah. is important. It's not an either or. And I think a lot of times and why I was really excited that you agreed to do this was because we need to show people that it's not either or we need to break some stereotypes. You can have fun. You can miss class and run into your prof and, you know, just own it and be like, yeah, like I'll see you tomorrow. It's fine. Like this is real life at school. You can be the person having fun and you can be the person that's setting goals and, and achieving them. Um, it's not all about, you know, academic excellence. It's not about, you know, having the A pluses, um, across the board. I haven't, you know, all the people that I brought on here, it's not the people that all scored at the top or, you know, who have had similar stories, but I, you know, I wanted to hear about you and where you've been, because like you said, you've had that, um, that variety of background and you do demonstrate kind of a lot of what, um, what I'm really proud of to be here with Dow students. So yeah, let's let's talk about some of your co-ops. Let's talk about maybe your work experience before your co-ops. Um, did you have work experience before you came to, to Dow? Uh, my work experience kind of was capped or limited to, so when I was 14, my young, I have a younger brother, so he's two years younger than me. So when I was 14 and when he was 12, we decided, we kind of wanted to make a bit of money to be able to buy ourselves some new hockey sticks. The composite sticks were pretty expensive. I think they're 300 bucks. So my dad was like, 
he didn't want to buy both of us a stick. So he was like, why don't you guys go try and make some money? And then, and then he would, he would try and help us out if we actually like put in an effort. So we kind of drafted up a, a riggedy old um, flyer on word. And I think we printed 25 of them and walked around as a 14 and 12 year old in our neighborhood and kind of handed those out. And then that, so that was kind of the start of our little business and still to this to this day, it's still operating. So we just wrapped up our ninth year in business. What was on the flyer? Not much, not much. We, it was just like, we wanna, we wanna cut your lawn at a low fee. And we had one client that kind of called us back. And I remember going to his house and being so nervous. And we were, our, our cost, I believe back then was $30 for a huge, huge lawn. And I was so nervous giving the quote. And then, yeah, so that kind of year over year started to grow. We would pick up more and more and more clients. And then, yeah, so that's still going on to this day. So I guess before Dal, that was pretty much the extent of my work experience. Amazing. So, hey, I want to dig into just one thing that you said. So you were so, so nervous, but you yeah. did it anyways. What, yeah. like, share with me how you do that when you're faced with something that's nerve wracking like how do you do it anyways because a lot of people might be listening to this or might say yeah I've been nervous too and I chose not to do it like how do you know kind of when or how to kind of push through that yeah so I think for me I'm someone at least my personality is someone that's very go 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 and I think if I'm kind of sitting a bit stagnant or maybe not doing too much that kind of gives me a bit of anxiety I'm always thinking of what what more can I do what else could I be doing to kind of better position myself so I think for me it's the thought of if I hadn't done it it would be the thought of oh why didn't I do that and I'd be sitting at home and I think kind of just that anxiety for me forces me to kind of take chances and take risks and I think if you're not taking any chances or risks you're not not really going to propel yourself forward or kind of get the benefits of taking those risks so I think that's kind of what pushed me yeah I actually I really like that because so often we think that the choice is to do something or not but we kind of forget that the or not is also a choice like yeah. well the, the default is a choice and we yeah. have to live with our choice whether we actively make it or we or we passively don't it's like yeah. oh if I don't do anything I can't get harmed it's like well no if you had an idea and you had a plan and then you choose not to do it, that's a choice. And the outcome is, is a representation of that choice. So yeah. uh, it's neat that you can kind of see both angles. Like, yeah. and yeah, no, I'd, I'd rather make the mistake trying something than not even make that mistake at all. Because I think once you make that mistake you can kind of learn from it. And next time you take that risk or take that chance, you should be better for it. I really like that. Um, if there's something you want to do, rather have the regret or make the mistake of doing it and then learning from it versus yeah the regret of like what if what if what? I would have tried yeah. that so and that's life actually goes quick. life goes quick so I think you got to take those chances and make the most of each year each opportunity life does go quick <laughs> especially in COVID does especially yeah COVID. no doubt um that's actually another reason why I think <clears throat> it's been wonderful to talk with you. So a little bit of background. When did you graduate? So I graduated, well, my diploma's up there. So I graduated in April, 2019. Okay. So not that long ago, about two years. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And what did you do? What did I do after I graduated? So I had decided that I wanted to do a graduate diploma program. So I applied to both Queens and U of T and then ultimately did the U of T program. So I moved to, I think I drove from, I'm from Ottawa. So I drove from Halifax to Ottawa the next day after graduation. And then I believe I moved to Toronto that weekend, kind of lived in Toronto and got the GDIP program done. And I think that was three months. And then after that, uh, with, along with four other friends that graduated from Dow, we went to Asia. So we, picked up, packed our backpacks and went for a good two months. So we kind of traveled from Southeast Asia all the way up to kind of Japan. Okay. So that was fun. And then since then, I, after that, I went back and started kind of full-time in October, 2019, I guess. Started and what makes this unique is you went back, um, started full-time. So at this point you did your GDIP, so equivalent of core one, core two, yeah. tax and assurance. 
And you went back, not went back, but like you started uh, back at the firm that you did some co-ops, correct? Yeah. And what's kind of neat is you had done your co-ops in tax. So you're big four in tax. And so you're starting in tax and then, you know, you don't have to get into too, too many details, but at some point, um, I know we had a bit of a conversation and I'm sure you saw, you were thinking about it for a bit. Um, what did you ultimately decide after coming back starting in October? Um, where did your path lead you next? Yeah, so it started in October and then I guess three months in, so around December, I decided to kind of make a switch. So I switched from EY in the Ottawa office to KPMG in the Ottawa office, in their Ottawa office, but then also switched from corporate tax to audit. And funny enough, I called Sam as I was, the decision ended up coming down on a very tight deadline. So I ended up calling Sam to kind of get a bit of advice. And yeah, so then I switched into audit at KPMG um, starting uh, the first day back from the Christmas break. So January, 2020. And then I've been there, I guess, a year, just over a year now, so 13 months. So was part of your decision about going, uh, about, you know, making that leap and saying that you'd rather regret something versus doing yeah. something? Yeah, I think inherently, I think my skill set or my personality, personality kind of drives better in an audit position. I mm. think audit um, kind of allows you to be a little more client facing and take take on a little bit more responsibility at uh, kind of a, a more junior level. So I think that's kind of why I switched. It's, it's really interesting that you say that because I just want people to know that you killed it in tax. You were part in uh, Adele. You were um, the president of the accounting society. You also were, I believe the co-lead for the tax clinic or at least very heavily, yeah, co-lead or like the fourth year lead of the tax clinic. Um, you excelled in your tax course. And so this wasn't so much about leaving tax, but rather going to something that suits your skill set. And so I just want to make that that really clear. Like it's yeah. you put yourself in a position to earn earn multiple options. And what's kind of really cool is that, you know, sometimes we find ourselves in a position and we try to wait until the perfect time. But sometimes you got to make your own perfect time. So you start in busy season at a big four firm in audit. And I actually just found this out. And so I'm going to put you on the spot. Um, you know, we can always edit anything. You can always email me afterwards. Um, but you start as an intermediate. WTF. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, that's kind of how I felt uh, throughout busy season last year as an intermediate and having no uh, prior audit experience. So it was definitely tough, but. As, as I kind of said in Sam and I's conversation earlier on, it's, I think when, when things are tough, that's when you're forced to learn. And inherently, I think for myself, I'm someone that's going to try and figure, try my best and figure it out. And all you can do at the end of the day is try your best. So I was definitely excited with the challenge of kind of coming in as an intermediate. And I think looking back on it now, it's, it's definitely, it's been nice and it's been good. Yeah. So, okay. Um, let's continue down the path. So you do uh, the intermediate thing. Uh, yep. Hello job. First day. Here's your laptop. Yeah. Like, I don't know about you, but my first job, the first week, I was always nerve wracking. Like, where's the lunch room? Where's, <laughs> where's the bathroom? How do I log into my computer? And so you jump, jump right into above and beyond all that. Then May and you, you thrive, you survive. And we'll get to where that leads to in a moment. Then May hits and you start capstone one. How is that? How is it going from like a GDIP program where um, where it's intense, it's in per at that time it was in person, and then yeah. you transition to CPA PEP in Capstone One. And it's not just Capstone One, like a module, it's the group project. So how is it meeting your group? How is it knowing that this Capstone One was going to roll forward to the day one case? Like what were your thoughts about that? Yeah, it was it was definitely tough because I think. For me, doing the GEDA program, I had never had to balance both work and then also kind of school or any CPA programs or modules at the same time. So it was tough for me at the start, start especially to kind of balance both. And then my plate was pretty full with work. So it was, it was a lot of late nights. I think I would kind of reserve my 10 p.m. to midnight or 9 p.m. to midnight slot once a week to try and work through that. But uh, ultimately, it's it's it's. I think it's a good project because you get to work with different people. So 
my group was, I think one other big four, uh, per one other person that worked at a big four, and then a few people that worked in non for profits and um, government entities. So, so kind of a good mix of skill yeah, sets. Good, good mix of skill set, good diverse experience, and kind of hearing kind of what what their job is on a day to day, and then also kind of working towards that goal. It's nice, as I said earlier, like it's nice for me to kind of work with people. I enjoy talking to people, so. I, I, I enjoyed it. It was definitely tough. It was a lot of late nights, but uh, we were able to get through it. Yeah. You also see like the end, like with the, yeah. each of the module, it's like eight weeks. So sometimes yeah. it's like, and you know, week, week one, just submit this, you know, project plan, <laughs> project schedule. Okay. Yeah. Week two, Kate got part one in. Week five, Kate, part two. Yeah. Uh, week seven, okay, the whole thing. And then we have a week to prep for the exam. But so it's kind of broken down in such a way that you can't really you can't fall behind without failing, no, right? Exactly. So it's, exactly. you got yeah. the little bit of a carrot, but capstone one is also like, you know, yeah. you're able to kind of plan in um, those three hour chunks or those times with your groups and kind of make it work that way. Exactly. And yeah, when I was, when I was maybe busier, when I had a busier week or an audit wrapping up, I think some of my other team members would kind of pick up a bit more and then vice versa. When I was a little lighter with work, I was able to kind of pick up a bit more. So it's really about working together and you guys are all, all trying to do the same thing at the end, right? So, yeah, um, there doesn't need to be any blame or shame. All just focus on the goal because you yeah. got to get there together. Um, yeah. There's no, yeah, perfect. You can definitely see kind of the sports and also, yeah, just seeing the people part of it and remembering that like we're not uh, we're not accountants in isolation, right? It's yeah. got to get there. So then how did Capstone 2 look for you? Were you working? Were you not working? Was it half and half? Like, what did your summer look like? So I think with KPMG, I believe our KPMG uh, allows the writers of study leave, so which is really nice. So I think my study leave started first week of July, I believe, or second week of July. So I think 90% of my Capstone 2 was, I was simply studying and they had kind of built in um, the deadlines for Capstone 2 within kind of our KBMG uh, study calendar. So it was nice. All you kind of had to do was follow the KBMG calendar and you'd meet all the deadlines. Perfect. And did KBMG provide extra cases above and beyond Capstone 2? Because Capstone 2, I just bring it up because Capstone 2 has its own calendar. Yeah. So you have like a day one and a day three each week or a day two and a day three yeah. each week. So they layered on like a little bit more. Yeah, so they layered in quite a, quite a few more cases. Some were with a company, a consulting company called uh, Densmore. So some yeah. were Densmore cases, and then some, I believe, uh, KPMG just kind of draft, drafted up on their own. So it was a mix of kind of KPMG's cases, Densmore's cases, and then Capstone too. So we had lots and lot, lots and lots of case writing. And then in excess of that, they had additional cases that you could do on your own time, but um, they kind of suggested just stick to stick to the schedule. It's kind of a tried and true schedule, and they spent quite a bit of time to refine it. So they said just just kind of stick to the plan and don't uh, don't burn yourself up. So at the point where you've done dial accounting, you've done the Toronto GDIP, um, you've done Capstone One, Capstone Two, and some of the KPMG and Densmore cases. When you when you started to write uh, the CV. About a year and a half post graduation, how did you feel? I felt I didn't feel great the first case because I think for someone that's done a GDIP program, you haven't written a case in almost pretty close to a full calendar year. So I think the first few cases, it's it's pretty tough because you you don't have like uh, for me it was the like time crunch, the time pressure you have writing these these cases. It's so tight. So I think the first few cases took me a bit to kind of get used to it and get back into the case writing, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, making fair. my plan and all those things. But once I got into, I'd say probably week three, week four, I felt uh, pretty comfortable kind of some of the skills I had learned at Dow specifically, and then U of T as well. I was able to kind of start, start to feel like those benefits and it started to get a little bit easier, which is, which I think is to be expected. Yeah. Um, and how, absolutely. How did it feel being, knowing that the May CV that year was canceled and knowing that you're in the smack dab of COVID, um, was there ever a fear or concern that the CV may not happen? And how did you, 
how did you balance all the all the worlds going on with your study and your your CP prep? Yeah. yeah, I think I think I was a little bit worried because I, at that point I had invested quite a bit of time yeah. in terms of studying and all these things, and I didn't didn't want to have to spend another summer kind of studying Absolutely. when I had already this over a calendar year. You're likely to forget a lot of the stuff and kind of you're gonna have to start from scratch again. So I didn't. And I wanted selfishly wanted to travel like this upcoming summer. So I was like, I need to get this done mm -hmm. um, last year. So I think I was a little bit worried. Um, but ultimately, I don't think I let it kind of get to me too, too much just because it's something you can't control, right? It's out of your control. So just control what you can and kind of put your head down and work. And yeah. Yeah. No, um, control what you can. <laughs> um, yeah. But that would be absolutely um, unnerving. Uh, so yeah. give yourself, please give yourself um, the, lots of credit. All the writers last year really deserve um, that's a mental, just mental hurdle, yeah. right? Um, yeah. A lot of uncertainty, and our grads are dealing with a lot of uncertainty. Our people that are writing the modules right now, um, and like I know we've heard a lot about grit and a lot about you know becoming stronger. And I think it's important to recognize that yeah, whatever hardships we go through, um, a some people have it worse right? Many people have worse. And yeah. yeah, we will be better because of it. But at the same time, give ourselves some credit now for being in the moment. And if you have a bad day or you have a bad hour, or you need to just like peace out, like just take your time yeah. and like have that, have those bad days and let yourself yeah. feel it because yeah, like it, it does suck and then come back and yeah. refocus exactly. and do your best. Exactly. Agreed. Um, so what, what future plans do you have? What are you considering? What is on the horizon for you? Oh, uh, what's on the horizon? I guess you're like, first I've of all, been, surviving busy season. <laughs> yeah, yeah, surviving busy season, kind of getting getting the audit out the door. As I'm kind of focused on one audit specifically that takes up about eighty percent of my year, so trying to see that towards the finish and kind of make sure that that gets signed off and everything's done on time. So I'd say that's kind of my first first hurdle um, in terms of kind of plans plans um, after that. I'm should be meeting the CPA uh, practical requirement in June, I believe, May or June. Nice. Holy crap! Yeah. That comes up so, quicker yeah. than wow. Yeah, yeah. So that's exciting. So as of I guess May or June, I should be should should have met all the CPA requirements. So hopefully be able to put um, those three letters behind my name would be nice. And then from there, um, keep keep kind of growing within my current job. I'm really enjoying audit. And this year I've switched on to kind of a focus towards uh, public companies, so. And not only public companies, sorry, I totally missed something um, that happened. What was it? Was it in September or October? uh october october 1st october 1st what happened in october you got a friggin promotion no 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 october 1st i was promoted to a senior account so from intermediate to senior yeah that was that was exciting uh yeah, yeah. for sure so yeah. so many times people will say you know oh i should go into this field because there's so many jobs i should go into this yeah. because uh, you know, this is the path I should do this because, and they look at the numbers because we're accountants and we like numbers yeah. and there's something to be said about like, you know, certainty or like, if, if this is what the many is, then chances are that I can do it. But the thing is about your path is while it might look traditional to somebody on the outside, there was a lot of kind of quote risk or like a lot of betting on yourself and a lot of like showing up for yourself. So yeah. I just really want to emphasize that. And I know, um, I know that you know, we don't like to pat ourselves on the back a lot, but it's really important to show show other people who may want to do that, who maybe want to, you know, go for a role that, you know, that maybe they haven't, you know, done the traditional stepping stones to, yeah. but they can do, go there, they can learn, they can, you know, bring the work, bring the effort, bring the nine PMs, you know, if they want to do that and they can um, be promoted, you know, yeah. way, 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 um, you know, early, but, right on time at the same time, right? Right mm -hmm. on time, yeah. because not only did you get promoted, but like you said, you transitioned to large public um, or public companies, um, large like cross-listed. So dealing with 
um, the TSX and the NASDAQ, right? Yeah. And on, so inherently within that, IFRS, um, you know, uh, financial yeah. statements, which, yeah. and it's not, I don't want to like out the company, but, you know, not easy, not easy topics. And um, just how long did you say that memo was that you were talking about the other day? Yeah, I've I've written some pretty long memos, so I think some some of the memos have been upwards of uh, I think thirty thousand words, twenty five thousand words. So it's despite being in accounting, I wouldn't say I'm the best writer, but I think my writing has definitely improved over over the last six months and as a senior and on a new client. And so. within that, you said something. Um, that I thought was really neat is that you were focusing on um, like subjective items. So it was about building arguments. It was about understanding uh, the technical, but then there is no kind of quote unquote right answer. It's yeah. what do I see? What are the risks? How do I support it? What, you know, what are the angles? And then having a position and supporting it and either, you know, having your manager agree or, you know, coming back to the drawing table and, you know, getting new insights. And yeah. so the way that you explained it to me and the way that I hopefully have repeated it, um, just really uh, like encapsulates the professional judgment and the professional skepticism. And like the fact that, um, you know, I think one of my most like the funniest but not funny teaching moments was when I had a student uh, or like a candidate in CPA scream at me that I should just teach in professional judgment. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's no, frustrating, it, right? Like that's right. that's how you get there. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Like the yeah, professional skepticism skepticism, I believe, like kind of comes with time and it's definitely frustrating. Like as you start out an audit, you're focusing primarily on vouching and there's always an answer. Whereas kind of as you start to move up and I think in in any type of client as you start doing the planning, a lot of it is subjective, right? It's kind of trying to determine what the risk really is and kind of where that risk lies. And then how, how are we going to address it? So I think over time, it's uncomfortable, but I think over time you do kind of learn the professional skepticism as, as the teachers love to say. Yeah. Uh, and I'm just so super excited because there's two things from your skill set that you have evolved just kind of as meta skills. Um, and one is just betting on yourself, always betting on yourself, um, always. Yeah. And I like the IFRS angle because if you, um, if you have the desire to leave the door open to international work, whether, you know, within industry, within public practice, um, having that foundation um, is, is just such a nice ticket ticket writer, right? Um, having that foundation. So uh, that makes me really excited um, for you. Um, what advice would you have for my third and fourth year accounting students? They are sitting at home. Some of them I haven't met. My, my oh. third year is a lot of them I haven't met in person. So um, a lot of them have been doing this online thing for about a year and a half. Um, and then another group are about to graduate, uh, graduate in two months. So thinking about you know, where you were um, in third or fourth year, thinking about our students, um, what advice do you have? I would say kind of from the outset, try and set academic goals and try and um, try and balance academics and then also your social life or other interests you may have. I think for me, that was something that we touched on it a bit, but that was something that I kind of prioritized is to make sure that, yes, I was getting all my work done. I was getting the grades I needed to, but it was also... I look back pretty fondly of my university and I, I enjoyed every minute. And sometimes when I'm working and I'm in busy season and stuff like that, I, I do kind of reminisce and school is a lot of fun. So I would say academics are important, but also kind of spend the time and have fun. And it's a little tougher with COVID, but have fun with your friends, whatever, whatever that may be. For us, it was going to uh, go in the cheers and splitties quite a bit. So we definitely made time for that, but we also got our work done. So that would be in terms that would be something for university and then kind of as you transition into work i'd say as we've touched on like try try and bet on yourself believe in yourself and if you want if you want an opportunity most of the times that opportunity is not just going to come and fall into your lap you're gonna have to kind of speak up and those conversations can be uncomfortable but if you want to be on a certain client or if you want to maybe switch roles or switch switch position positions i think that you need to kind of take that chance and have those conversations. So 
I think those those are the two main things or two or three main things that I would suggest. I'm curious, how, okay, would you, because you were somebody that would come to office hours occasionally, or like you would, you would be in the row, you would study in the row. So yeah. knowing that, you know, not knowing what the, what next year will look like, we don't know if we're online or uh, in person, but just say, say they're online. So now you're speaking to the third years who, um, yeah, haven't, haven't met myself, haven't met Laura, haven't met Tammy in person. Um, how would you, um, would you see any benefit in trying, you know, how do you establish that relationship maybe with their peers or with us or like, what would you do to ensure that you maximize your university experience if that was one of the constraints that you were facing? Yeah, I, don't, I, I think it's tough. I've never been in school in this COVID virtual environment, but I would say when, when you do have questions, don't be afraid to ask them. And I think if you have that question, likely 80% of the room has the question or a virtual room or whatever it may be. I think, yeah, it'll, there's no stupid questions. If, if you have that question, a lot of other people have that question, then that's kind of how you can start to build that report with your prof. And then um, in terms of building a report with your peers, I think for us, we had a good group of, uh, good group of about five or six guys that would all, all study together. So I would say, try, try and, try and kind of network or try and get to know people in your class because those people are also going through the same assignments and stuff. Don't plagiarize, but you can definitely kind of work together and bounce, bounce ideas off each other. So I think that kind of made, made some of those late nights in the row or, or stuff like that when we were studying we kind of made it fun and we were doing it together and we'd have dinners together and stuff. So it was, it was fun. Absolutely. So, yeah. Thank you. Have... <laughs> How do you define success? How do I define success? I think, I think as you progress in your career, I think success can kind of change your definition. Like as I, as I kind of get further into my career and I'm not that far, I think um, kind of your happiness at the end of the day is, is most important. So whatever, whatever it takes to kind of do that, whether that's fulfill, like fulfilling yourself with work and on being on complex stuff and kind of devoting quite a bit of your life to work. I think if that's, if that's what makes you happy, then it is. And if I have friends that are kind of just traveling even in these COVID times and have a university degree, but are traveling. So I think, and just really, really enjoying it. And I would say they're happy. So I would just say kind of focus on, focus on what you can and, and kind of find your happiness wherever, wherever that may be and kind of go from there. Now you said um, as you progress throughout your career that that definition can change. Can you elaborate a bit on that? Um, I, or maybe I'll, I'll start and you can jump in. Um, so many times we hear, you know, purpose or we hear giving back or we hear some, I don't want to call them buzzers because I don't want to cheapen them, yeah. but I really like how you said as, as you maybe get closer to it or as you, you know, have one definition um, and if that's, you know, work for you, if this is like the season yeah. of work, um, you know, season meaning busy season or season being like, you know, this is your goal, like three years, two years, one year, whatever the goal is, um, that, and like, that's okay. And it's what I hear and correct me if I'm wrong, is that it's okay if it changes. And in fact, yeah. maybe expect it to change like yeah. and shift, yeah. but be yeah. aware of that underlying happiness. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. I agree. And for me, like when I first started in, in all my co-ops, I've always been work, 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 work. So I think now I'm trying to shift um, to maybe improve my work-life balance slightly. And I think that's still being able to, being able to kind of deliver a high quality product, but um, kind of finding ways to be more efficient or finding ways to um, kind of save some time. I mm -hmm. think those are those are things that I'm trying to do personally, and I think that comes comes with time as you as you progress through the ranks and into your career. Yeah, and as you progress, um, just a little bit of a, uh, I don't know, what do they call them? Like the little the balls with the future in them. Yeah. Uh, it's saying no and yeah. and saying yes to the right things and no um, because. So, so far, like early on in our careers, we tend to focus on like getting the door open. And then sometimes there hits almost like a tipping point um, where the doors you'll like 
so may, may, you know, fly open because you put in all that work and it's kind of come. And so understanding and how to have that decision matrix sort of set up yeah. on what do you say yes to and what's yeah. important and having that time for reflection. So I'm really, yeah. I'm really excited to see, um, see what comes for you because you put in the work. So yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree 100%. Final comments, yours or mine. Final comments. Yeah, no, I don't think, I think we've touched on pretty much everything. Um, if anyone has any questions or wants to reach out to me on LinkedIn, um, you should be able to find me. My name is Zachary Brandt. So you just find me on there and send me a message. I'll get back to you. And if you have any questions about DAL or GDIP or just kind of general questions about life or want advice or KPMG, um, KPMG is currently hiring in most of their offices across Canada. So, lovely um i will lovely. link i will link your linkedin <laughs> yeah. uh there and yeah i encourage people to reach out because it's not just reaching out to tammy laura myself and if anything it's it's reaching out to you it's reaching out um, i spoke to staff i talked to to julia it's reaching out to people whose stories um you know resonate with you or yeah. you know or they're like oh crap like because you were you were there you were in their yeah. seats you know, virtually or otherwise, I think sometimes you were virtually in the yeah, seat. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a couple. yeah, and you'll always give, um, always give good advice. And I always appreciated your attitude. And uh, yeah, no, thank you. Thanks for doing this. Yeah, no problem. My pleasure.